Exodus from the Epistle of Blessed Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 6 to 13. Brethren, let us not covet evil things as they also coveted, neither become ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed fornication, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and perished by the serpents. Neither do you murmur as some of them murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them in figure, and they are written for our correct correction upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore he that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Let no temptation take hold on you, but such as is human, and God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make also with temptation issue that you may be able to bear it. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time when Jesus drew near Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also had known, and that in this thy day the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children who are in thee, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. And entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Today is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. This Holy Mass is being offered for the people of the parish. In the back of the church near the bulletins is a copy of the recent letter that Cardinal Burke issued in response to the uh, most recent motu proprio. So if you haven't read that, you might be interested in it. And again, they're available uh, near the bulletins at the back of the church. Also today, the second collection is for the expenses of the air conditioning. Usually, daily, the air conditioner is running for about 13 hours. And as you can imagine, elevating very much the uh, electric bill. So today's second collection will be will help to cover uh, the expenses of the air conditioning during these summer months. Someone in the parish prepared themselves for a year to make a consecration to the guardian angel, Noemi Cardena, so I ask if she would please come forward now to the communion rail to make the consecration to the guardian angel. Veni Creator Spiritus, mentes tuorum visita in place superna gratia, que tu creasti pectora, qui diceris paraclitus donum Dei Altissimi, fons vivus inis caritas, et spiritale sumptio. Tu septi formis munere, dextre Dei tu digitus, tu rite promissum patris, sermone ditans gutura. Accende lumen sensibus, infunde amorem cordibus, in firma nostri corporis, virtute firmans perpeti. Ostem repelas longius, pacem poedones protinus, ductores sic te previo, vitemus omne noxium. Te persiamus da patrem, nos camus atque filium, te utriusque spiritum, credamus omni tempore. Deo Patris et Gloria, et Filio qui amortuis, 
Surexit ac paraclito, in seculorum secula. Amen. Emite spiritum tuum et creabuntur. Oremus Deus, qui corda fidelium sancti spiritus illustrazione docuisti, per nobis in eodem spiritu recta sapere, et de eius semper consolatione caudere, per Christum Dominum nostrum. A point number 15 in the booklet, point number 15. Fall, uh, Noemi is called to make the consecration to the guardian angel. Uh, dear sister, what do you seek? Number 17, what do you seek? of this consecration is to bind oneself to one's holy guardian angel so that his self can become much more efficacious in us and we advance more rapidly on our way to God. The holy guardian angel wishes to employ his whole strength that we never again separate ourselves from God. He wants to speak more clearly to us through inner admonitions, motivate us more effectively to do good, alert us to dangers, illumine our mind so that we may penetrate more deeply into the knowledge of God, the fear of the Lord, and the love of God, as well as into the greatness and significance of the Word of God. The consecration to the guardian angel should open and dispose us for all guardian angel services upon earth, especially the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Have you taken this to heart? The members of the work strive to give the holy angels as much space as possible in their lives and apostolate so that the angels can work with them for the glory of God and the salvation of the world. Those individuals are fit for the work of the holy angels who love God and the holy angels, who themselves gladly render guardian angel services and realize the need of expiation, who stand up for the holy church and do not criticize her, who gladly pray and are not afraid of sacrifice. Are you ready for this? Are you determined to incorporate into your life the great fundamental directions of the work, adoration and contemplation, expiation, and the mission to serve like your guardian angel in keeping with your state in life? Holy Virgin Mary and Mother of God, you are the Lady and Queen of all angels, and therefore also of our Holy Guardian Angels. Here before the eyes of our Lord and God, before your countenance, and in the sight of all angels and saints, we want to acknowledge the divine mission of our Holy Guardian Angel by committing ourselves entirely to him and binding ourselves solemnly to him.
Lord, Almighty God, may the gift of our consecration and the intercession of our holy guardian angels be pleasing in your sight. May those whom we venerate on earth be our advocates with you in heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Amen. My dearly beloved in Christ, a wise bishop once said, Sin is the shipwreck of the soul. If the sin is serious, it is a fatal shipwreck. Confession is the only plank to which we can safely cling, if we want to be brought back to the harbor of God's grace. If, on the other hand, we receive the sacrament of penance with the proper dispositions, not only will it give us grace, but confidence and peace of mind as well. This sacrament has very appropriately been called the masterpiece of God's mercy. We should be very grateful to God for this gift. Having heard in the epistle today about temptation, and not falling into sin, and our dear Lord in the Gospel today, weeping over the city of Jerusalem, I thought it would be good to focus this sermon on the sacrament of confession, on its proper place, and most particularly giving a few points of practical guidance when you go to confession. First, as we prepare to go to confession, awareness of what constitutes a mortal sin versus a venial sin is very important. Some people feel that every sin they commit is a mortal sin, which is not correct. To commit a mortal sin, one must do something that is gravely and objectively evil, do it with full knowledge that it is evil, and give full consent to it with the will. A good example would be, for the next two weeks, I'm going on vacation. I have planned the hotels and the restaurants and the activities. I know that I'm going to be away for two Sundays, but I am not going to go to Mass. I am simply going to go to confession when I return home after my vacation. That is a mortal sin. You are intentionally, willfully planning on not going to Mass and then committing the further sin of a presumption of God's mercy that I'm simply going to sin, offend him grievously, and then go to confession. It's as if a spouse would say, I'm going to beat you up and all of this and be abusive to you and then tell you I'm sorry. We don't do that to God. We don't do that. We don't commit sin willfully, intentionally, and then run to confession. When we go to confession, it is to be after a slip, after a fall, through our human weakness. Venial sin, on the other hand, is a deviation, but not a total turning away from God. We can liken it to a sickness of the soul, which may reflect lukewarmness in us. Venial sins, we can say, bruise our state of grace with God, but they do not kill it as a venial sin does. Secondly, when one is aware of a mortal sin, he should go to confession as soon as possible, not waiting. We know that it just takes one mortal sin, unconfessed, to spend an eternity in hell. We don't know when God is going to call us to give an account of our life before him. Sometimes people die suddenly. There's no time for repentance or confession. So we must be ready for that meeting with God when he chooses to call us. It is also necessary to go to confession, having committed a mortal sin, before receiving 
Holy Communion. St. Paul says that we are never to eat and drink the body and blood of Christ unto our condemnation. Regarding venial sin, one does not have to go to confession every time before receiving Holy Communion for every venial sin. The Church teaches that if one has only committed venial sins and makes a, a sincere act of contrition or the reception of Holy Communion or the use of holy water, venial sin will be taken away. It sometimes happens, however, that a person falls into mortal sin, goes to confession, and then one or two days later goes back to confession for the same sin. Knowing that confession is always available here at Holy Innocence may cultivate a mentality that one really does not have to try to refrain from falling into habitual sins. Overtly frequent confession could be an indicator of presumption of God's mercy and perhaps a weakened resolve to not sin again. I'm tempted, I'm just going to commit this sin now and go to confession tomorrow. Again, we don't willfully offend God and then run to confession. We are to fight the battle, fight the fight, use the graces that God gives us to resist sin and fight temptation. So going to confession too frequently may indicate an abuse of the sacrament. And certainly you do not go to confession the next day for having committed a venial sin. So the priests here at Holy Innocence ask that you not make confession more than once per week. I'm not speaking of mortal sin. If you commit mortal sin, go right away. But for the small venial sins, do not go more than once a week. It can also contribute to scrupulosity. A good standard practice would be that I go to confession every two weeks, uh, I should definitely go once a month, no question about that, for anyone who is serious in growing in the spiritual life and growing closer to God. But weekly confession is laudable, and it helps us for the plenary indulgence uh, to gain the indulgence. If we're going to confession weekly, we're fulfilling that eight-day requirement of confession uh, with the plenary indulgence. So in order to gain an indulgence, you do not have to go to confession on the day. You don't have to go to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday. You can go before that. You do not have to go to confession on the first Saturday of the month. You can go before the first Saturday for the first Saturday devotion. Our Lord even said to Sister Lucia about the first Saturday confession that it can even be longer than a week. It could be even uh, several weeks, provided the person is receiving communion in the state of grace. A fourth point to consider is that some people have a habit of regularly reconfessing past sins, a type of a general confession, and sometimes they repeatedly do that. You should only confess those sins committed since your last confession so that the priest has a better sense of whether he needs to give you any specific spiritual guidance. An exception to this guideline is that if you remember a mortal sin from the past, which you have not confessed, then do confess that sin in your next confession. Fifthly, and very importantly, the sacrament of confession is for confession and absolution. It is not a time of conversation. It is not a place for spiritual direction. It is not a place to extend your confession by asking questions and discussing your spiritual life. That all can indicate a lack of charity to those in line behind you who will have to unnecessarily wait longer because of all of this extra conversation. 
the confession of sins should be fairly concise, it should be specific to the point and well prepared. Lengthy and detailed explanations of what you did and how you came about doing it are not necessary and again only make those behind you in line wait longer. It also may even be a subtle way of you justifying your sin if you have to explain it. Simply confess the sin, and if the priest needs more information, he will ask you. On the other hand, the sins you confess should be reasonably specific rather than general observations. For example, you wouldn't say, Father, I did not follow God's commandments. That's very, very vague. Rather, please specify the ways in which you have not followed God's commandments. No stories. Do not bring someone else's sins to the confessional with you. It's your confession. So, the sign of the cross, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been a week since my last confession. I lost my temper once. I had uncharitable thoughts three times. I took God's name in vain twice. I had impure thoughts once. For these and all my sins, I am sorry. No explanation of why you did it, how you did it, who brought you to do it. Simply state the sin and move forward. A good method is to be blunt, to be brief, and to be gone out of the confessional. And lastly, sometimes the priest might tell you something in confession that you may not want to hear. Please consider that the Holy Ghost sometimes works in ways that seem very blunt in order to help us uproot our sin. Try never to feel disheartened, but instead consider that perhaps the Holy Ghost inspired the priest to tell you something very plainly because you may need it to help you break out of it and to overcome it. So we should make frequent use of confession, but in the proper way, and use it as the church intends it to be used, rather than again, a bunch of stories and a bunch of explanations, which does nothing but lengthen the time in the confessional. I would say from start to finish, the confession should be no longer than five minutes. So if you haven't been to confession in a while, well then, now certainly is the time to go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.